Torah. I have a couple of of uh, extracurricular announcements to make. Oh, there's Harvey. Okay, I'm glad you got up. Um, the <laughs> I have been made aware, and I'm not totally surprised, that some of us uh, are feeling a level of discomfort about the renaming of University Synagogue. Yeah. And I am just making an offer out into the thin air. Uh, I would be happy to sit and chat with you at a separate time, just to do that. I don't have answers. And as I pointed out, I am not part of the establishment, um, but I think people need to be heard. I think their concerns need to be heard. Uh, and who knows if anything innovative comes out of such a conversation, I will pass it on. I will in fact do that. Uh, that's easy enough. So, Cindy, are you going to volunteer to receive notes from anybody who might like to meet? Um, I've already been proactive. I had Kareth came to the last sisterhood meeting to listen to feelings. Um, Rabbi Shapiro is coming to our next meeting to listen to our feelings. So I'm actively providing resources for that. I had a long conversation with Rabbi Shapiro. He took two pages of notes. I just repeated things I'm hearing and he, I, I did hear that he presented some of the things at a clergy meeting. So this is going on. Um, so you know, and my offer is not necessary right now? Not for the sisterhood board. Okay. And may I, can I make one comment? Sure. As a past president uh, whose term ended over 30 years ago, um, university campus had no resonance anyway. University synagogue was a name that just followed us from when we had a small building in Westwood near UCLA. So, I mean, in terms of the name of the campus, um, I don't feel that as a loss, which isn't to say there aren't a lot of other things going on, which I have, which I struggle with, but university campus just had no resonance or real connection anyway. Okay, Steve, thank you. I, I don't want to have that conversation here. And Cindy tells me that the sisterhood board is covered. Uh, if there's any desire for me to be involved in any way, I'm here because I'm part of the change. I'm seeing it, I'm living it, and fine. Just want you to know that I'm around, okay? And that people are listening to these concerns. Number two. Can I just add that it was always part of the deal of the merger that the, it would be renamed. We knew it all along. I think it's just seeing it in print. It's just one more step. Yeah, okay. And the second thing is, is rather interesting. My friend, Tony Fratello, uh, who covered for me one of the weeks in which I was away uh, for Chavra Torah, sent me a note saying he would love to get your feedback on his teaching. Uh, and he made that request. I trust me, you know me, I don't push people to do anything. Um, he is interested uh, because he loves the teaching opportunity with us. If anyone would like a positive, praising, questioning, complaining, anything, uh, suggestions, Tony wants to hear. And what I would like to do is if anyone over this coming week, ones that, oh, Tony was terrific. Oh, I fell asleep after five minutes. Whatever, whatever you choose to say, I will forward the comments to him having deleted your names. Okay? So you, you got total anonymity, except I will know. 
Um, and Tony asked. I did not ask him to ask. So that that that's enough on, on that particular. Can we just send him an email on our own if we don't mind being identified? Sure. Sure. But I, you know, fine. I just wanted to make it easy for people. Can you can you post your email address again? Uh, post his email address. Yours. Yours, so we can send you can send it to him. Oh, okay. Ooh, let's see if I can do that. Um, or just say it out loud. <laughs> here it goes. Rob Davids. At That's email. Com. Okay, thank you. You see, I can't type well. There it is. And okay, I got it. There I am. Uh, save the name campaign. Yeah. Uh, Harvey and Mara, not a problem. We come up with $15 million. We can own the name and buy it from the other family. That's what they paid. We can, I'll chair the committee. Okay. I mean, that, that's, that's just fine. Okay. So those are the things. Jim Ruxin is not on, at least I don't see him this morning. Uh, but I do know that there is a film of thing, something about the most horrible person in the world or something. I'm not sure what the name is. The worst person in the world. Well, I exaggerate. Oh, Jim is here. He heard his name and he popped in. Uh, okay. So there he's going to come in. So uh, Cindy. Uh, sisterhood stuff, what's happening? Anything? I'm um, just trying to figure out when the campus closes, what we're going to do. So everything's in process right now. Okay. And, and Jewishly speaking, we'd call that process theology. So, so that, that, that puts a holy uh, veneer to the whole thing. But we um, do, and Effie, I don't know if you got my email. Um, they no longer wish to store the sisterhood scrapbooks. So they're gonna be at our next meeting and anyone who wants to pick up old pictures before they throw out the old scrapbooks are welcome. And I'm sure they're lovely pictures of Shuli, Effie, if you can stop by. And I don't know if you wanna mention that if you have a plaque or a leaf, you're supposed to pick them up because the Yurtzeit plaques are gonna be just in a different format. And you have to let them know. So I picked mine up this week. Right. And, and what I would suggest is, folks, over the next several weeks, read the Wilshire Boulevard Temple Bulletin carefully. Really look at it because there's important stuff that touches upon us. Hi, Julie Given. You just came on. I wanted to say hello. Uh, that's funny. Jim came on and then he fled. Okay. Uh, May 25th. Uh, we're going to be having our next current events class. The good news is the world is falling apart. So the, I don't have to worry about thinking of, oh, Jim is coming back in now. Uh, I don't have to worry about topics and themes. I could talk about the potential collapse of the Israeli coalition. I could talk about, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and there's some really tough things happening in Israel among Israeli Jews and Palestinians. There's a lot of concern there. And unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of concern about what's going on with the Jewish community here in the United States. So we have plenty of stuff to talk about. Uh, May 25th, uh, Friday, May 27th, is the last service, if I get this date correctly, in the University Synagogue named facility. Uh, and in honor of the history of University Synagogue and trying to hold all the memories together, the service is going to be dedicated to Argentinian music and epinatas. Uh, and I, I'm just reporting things as they are. And tango oh, lessons. Oh, I forgot, I forgot tango. That's because, Cindy, I assure you, I will not be there for the tango lessons. Okay. Uh, but I will be there for the apanadas and, and other kinds of stuff. So 
Anyway, that is going to be May 27th, May 27th, and let's just see. Oh, next Saturday, a week from today, is the Siyum, if you can believe it. We are finishing Leviticus next week. I don't know how this happens. We are finishing Leviticus next week, and, and Cindy, um, I actually have bought a jar of pickled herring to have in my grasp. You know the problem. And well, as soon as we meet in person, I'm there bringing it. Yeah, but but until then, until then, next Saturday. And my last thing is June 4th, June 4th in the evening is Erev Shavuot. Um, and I will be teaching one of the classes uh, that'll be offered that evening. Uh, Saturday evening, June 4th, um, I'm going to be talking about, for example, you know, if giving Torah was such a big deal, why did God hold a mountain over our heads? Uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's some interesting midrashim about the giving of Torah. We'll have fun. Anyway, uh, June 4th, I think they just have like a couple of three hours. In the old days, when people had stamina, I would teach or arrange classes in my congregation from 7.30 at night to 7 in the morning. We served food, we had music, we studied the whole night because that's what we're supposed to do. This is a modern age. Everyone is, you know, sensitive. So we're going to have three hours. Um, but in any event, join us and we're going to have fun. Now, in checking in, uh, I know that Tamara will not tell us that this week she finished the very, 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 very last comments on her magnificent, soon to be published Yale Press book. Uh, and if you, Tamara, how long have you been working on that book? How long? I'm too embarrassed to tell you. Uh, can we just leave it at decades? Three decades three decades. And this week, it was finished. Uh, and that that's an incredible achievement, incredible achievement. Thank and of you. course, as um, what is the name of the book? Is there a name other than commentary on Ezra? That's what oh, it is. That's what it is. So um, anyhow, certainly because we are one small community, uh, once the book actually is out, you'll all be expected to buy a copy of the 900-page book, and we will have a test on the book. But that, that waits. Uh, Kathy Mendelson, hi, Kathy Mendelson, joined us. So that, that's, that's a great thing. And I know on the reverse that Merle today uh, is saying Kaddish for her mother. And, and we... We'll be saying Kaddish and Merle. What was her name, please? Relba Immerman. She is on the list. I know that she's on the list, but I want us to recognize it when it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, oh, is there any other, before I get to Jim, is there any other um, thing going on in your lives that you would like to share with us? Anything else? Okay. Shabbat shalom. I apologize. My computer was messed up. I couldn't talk. Couldn't say good morning. Couldn't say nothing. But here I am. I was trying to fix it. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay, Jim. I know that we have a movie tonight at seven thirty, and I keep saying the most horrible person in the world, but I know that's not accurate. It's called the worst person in the world. Yeah. I and know. it's a misnomer because the young lady at the heart of the film is anything but. It's about a 26 year old who's in the process of finding herself in a very honest and candid way. And men all around her fall in love with her and want to have children with her or, or don't. And she just says, I'm sorry, I'm not ready for that. And they say, well, what do you want? And her answer is, I don't really know, but I'm not ready for that. And she does it in such a candid, honest way. This is really the chronicle of a young woman trying to find her way in the world and the world doesn't take kindly to her honesty and her transparency. So I found this a remarkable throwback to my own 20s 
and uh, a way of helping us understand our children and grandchildren, if we have any of that age. And I found it ultimately profound. Incidentally, it was on many uh, 10 best lists and many best movie of the year lists in newspapers and magazines. So this is not a navel gazing film, as I said in my email, it's a thoughtful, sensitive uh, chronicle of uh, this period in a woman's life. And I think you'll find it very meaningful to you. At 7.30 tonight, and you can see it on uh, Amazon Prime, The Worst Person in the World. Okay, thank you. So, so Jim, would you therefore say that the film was pregnant with meaning? Uh, oh, you don't have to go there. Uh, pregnant with a promise of meaning. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, that's cool. Um, <coughs> so, we're ready to go forward, and I'm delighted to see everybody here. We are going to Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1. 850 in the plout, new plout, 749, uh, 749 in the women's Torah commentary, uh, page 850 in the plout. And for those of you who listen to the, the Facebook posting, one of the interesting things that pops up right away, just right away, um, page 850, uh, the eternal one spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, speak to the Israel people, speak to the Israelite people and say to them, Vayadaber Adonai, God spoke to Moses, Bahar Sinai, on Mount Sinai. The problem is, hi, Kat, the problem is that, of course, they're no longer at Mount Sinai. They have long ago left Mount Sinai. And there's, of course, all kinds of rabbinic conversation about why do this. Uh, Rashi asks, why on Mount Sinai? And Ibn Ezra will come in and say, you know what, folks? This chapter really belongs as the real chapter one of the book of Leviticus, and chapter one should become chapter two and so forth. It really is back at Mount Sinai. And how does it happen that it says God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai? Um, the question leads to prepackaged answers. One of my favorite answers is, Ein mukdama mukhar batorah. There's no chronological order in the Torah. Uh, and that's true. Another way to phrase that is the scribes who put the Torah together didn't always make, yeah, thank you, Effie. Effie is blocking his ears. Uh, didn't always maintain careful concern about what came first, what came later. Either way, either there's simply no chronology or this is simply evidence of the scribal activity. But there's something else here. Would someone like to offer, and Steve, I will get to you, I promise. Will, does someone want to tell me with precision what was revealed at Mount Sinai? We have Shavuot coming up. Tell me. Shavuot celebrates the giving of Torah at Sinai. What was revealed at Mount Sinai? Simple question. Easy. Okay, Marina. Ten Commandments. Okay, the Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone engraved, and the second set, and so forth. That's one answer. Are there any other answers, Steve? Um, there are many answers. Some people, I think, believe that the entire Torah and all of our oral law was transmitted at Sinai. Yeah, and we say oral law, just to be broadly clear, you're talking about all the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Mora, you know, all the stuff and all the stuff that continues to be derived from Torah really was all said at Sinai. But my comment on the chronology, which I, I also 
understand it's not in chronological order, but if you are writing a text with lessons, there may be a reason where this is the right place for this message to be, so you should do it as a flashback. I mean, there yes. are lots of reasons that you could put something in a text in a given place other than chronological order. So you and Rashi have a similar approach. Rashi came first, but I'm not going to, you know, that's fine. Um, Rashi said what was really given at Mount Sinai were general principles. And we have to be aware that all during the desert wandering, the particulars of the general principles were given to Moses when Moses encountered God in the tabernacle and so forth. So that Rashi believes that the general, the cloud, the general, I'm going to say this, the general principles were revealed to Moses at Sinai, but the particular points were revealed to Moses in a progressive revelation all during the desert wandering. Moses was getting revelation from God all during the desert wandering. And what Moses was getting was the details. Let me give you a detail. You know, six days you shall work on the Sabbath. The seventh, don't do any work. Somebody might, probably a member of this group, would say, oh, what's work? That's a particular of the general. And during the desert wandering, God made clear to Moses what the particulars were. So in this particular case, God is revealed. And so the occasion here is Jews, remember, ongoing revelation. There well, are Rabbi, may I say something? I also think that um, what was revealed on Sinai was that God is approachable through a prophet and the whole, all through the ages that with Abraham, God is approachable. He's approachable. And with Moses, he used Moses and the cloud up on the mountain. But God, as the Jewish people, we are we are able to approach the Lord through prayer and um, it's not just Moses. Okay. No, I mean, you know, got to give Moses some credit, but yes, yes. Um, then, then we say, save the name campaign. That goes my email address. What's the name of the book? Mazel Tov Tamara. Thank you. Old Plout 946. Uh, I thought that the text was not in chronological order. Mostly it's in chronological order, but the number of times it's not. Are we still in the holiness code? Yes, we are still in the holiness code. The holiness code is the last section of Leviticus. And if you say it that way, that means that, yes, yeah, since we have two weeks this week, next week, still in Leviticus, we are still in the Leviticus code. Um, Okay, the difference between the information reveal. Okay, so we see that the information revealed in a temple trustees meeting versus the newsletter, which has the details. Thank you for making everything you know, relevant. Okay. Um, having done that, here we are. Moses is sharing with the people a message from God. I decided that unlike all previous works, I'm going to be contrarian today. Um, and just because I'm usually an easygoing person agreeing with everything, we all, know, we all know that the Bible, the Torah, is replete with environmental messages. Does anyone remember any of the environmental messages that we've read from Genesis through Deuteronomy that are written into the Torah. Anyone, any environmental message? I see Steve. Right. What? I was gonna say the fields lying fallow periodically, a number of agricultural things which maintain the land so that it will continue. 
Okay, so that's actually going to be this sedra. This is right here. Okay, and yes, that's one of the environmental ecological uh, messages. And can you remember maybe two others? Two others? One other? A half? Okay. Uh, in, in the book of Genesis, God pretty much says to Adam and Eve, um, you got responsibility. You got responsibility for the garden. You have responsibility for the earth. And, and there, is, there is that. There's another thing in the book of Deuteronomy that says when you besiege a city, um, don't cut down the trees. Don't cut down the trees. Why? Are you making war against trees? You got to besiege a city, fine. Don't destroy the landscape. And, and certainly, as we observed in Vietnam, the United States Army was a firm follower of, of that particular mandate. Now, we look at when you enter the land that I assigned to you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of the eternal. That sentence is already troubling, but that's the beginning of what Steve referenced. We're going to talk about the sabbatical year, which is also called what? Do you know the alternative name? Got to listen to me. Not Shmata, but Shmita. Shmita. Shmata is Yiddish for a rag. Shmita means release. Shmita. Now, uh, I have a note from Tamara. Uh, there is also not eating the fruit of trees for the first three years. Yeah, that is an environmental issue. Um, and that means after the tree starts producing fruit, you have to wait three years before you can eat and sell that fruit. The first, the newly mature tree has to be treated with great care. I, I am not convinced that the intention of the scribal material is for environmental purposes. And that puts me way out on the edge of nasty people. I understand that. There are times when we read into the Torah text what we need to find there. Uh, I think I mean, one of the great, great, great rabbinic teachers of Jewish environmentalism is a rabbi named Arthur Waskow, W-A-S-K-O-W. If you really, really, really want to touch the, the academic intellectual heart of Jewish environmentalism, you must read, you go to the blog, you go to the teaching, you go to the books, Arthur Waskow. He is just amazing in his devotion to Jewish environmentalism. But I, over the years, have come to question whether our seeing environmentalism in six years work the land, seventh year not, as an environmental matter or a matter of reflecting our view that the land belongs to God and we have to stop pretending that we own it and for one year, take your dirty little hands off the land. This is God's. Learn to appreciate the fact that it all belongs to God. 
Now, I would suspect that if I said this in a rabbinic gathering, I would be brutally physically assaulted. And that's okay. Uh, but, and I, I'm open to conversation on this. I just don't know. Uh, you read commentaries, rabbinic commentaries. Instead of serving the land, serve God. There is also a pervasive worldwide view of the connection between the God or God's people worship, agricultural produce, and providing food for the God or gods. To assert, I'm going to stop and, and let you throw stones at me because, you know, this has got to be my view against the world, but to assert that the Jews uniquely understood the need ecologically for the land not to be worked periodically, for the land to re-strengthen itself. To me, oh, I'm, today I'm making Stanley David's extremely unpopular, and I, I relish that. Um, it's the same thing as asserting that the laws of Kashrut were for health purposes. They were not, in my point of view. Okay, Maimonides felt differently, but he's old and dead. Um, <laughs> hi, Sandra. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, I see Shuli. Excuse me, Shuli. I see Effie. I see Shuli. Every time I see Effie, I see Shuli. Uh, Effie, please join us. Couldn't it be both? They don't have to exclude each other. I'm willing to go there. I, I am uncertain enough, Effie, and it's a good thought, uncertain enough to say gam vagam, this and that. Okay. Yeah, it could still be some level of environmental awareness. Thank you. Any, any other comments? This is not a popular point of view. And don't go running to your next book club and say, oh, Jews didn't care about the environment. I'm not saying that. Uh, someone else have a hand? Harv? Oh, Hara, excuse me. I just have a question. Why is it on an unpopular stance? And why, why don't we teach that, in essence, the world is ours to borrow, but it is God's? Because I think what you're suggesting is that what we teach is that Judaism is materially based, which goes all kinds of ugly places as far as I'm concerned. It's another midrash to write. You got it, Mara. You've just given yourself a topic. Um, okay, Brad. Uh, Rabbi, I, I mean, this comes back to my question about this being in the holiness code. And is there a connection possibly to virtuous behavior uh, that, uh, in, in the sense that uh, our actions are, uh, are imitative of what God himself would be doing? and hence virtuous or holy. And I'm not sure of the difference between virtue and, and holiness. I mean, that's a, to me a fascinating question, but, but uh, I just, because it is in the holiness code, what is the connection? You know, and, and Brad, every time you teach me, and it's, it's fascinating, you, you flipped my mind to think about the, the rabbinic concept of tsar ba'alei chayim, 
uh, our, our obligation to take care of animals. Uh, we are not to cause them grief. So you, you can't plow uh, with two different kinds of animals, one that is strong, one that is weaker, because that puts a terrible burden on the animal. You got to feed your animals on Shabbat, even though you're not supposed to be doing any other kind of work. So, so yes, yes. But Tamara, would you please share your insight and, and just tell me how off I am? Yeah, I don't think there is a unique uh, ecological view in, in the parasha, in the Bible. I think farmers know about the need to do it. So what's unique is the pattern and regularizing it every seven years, and this is how you do it. And you do it as a community, and it's, it's given theological thing. But um, my son is now involved in farming, and all the young farmers know this, and they are not getting it from Leviticus. And uh, I remember, I can't remember his name, but a, a Roman farmer in the first century writing uh, instructions for farming. And it's very clear that there is this understanding, very sophisticated understanding of how agriculture thrives. So, I think what's unique is the part that you're emphasizing that's not making it strictly materialistic, but tying it to something more uh, universal and, and, and powerful than mere survival. But it's, I, I, I know it's not a unique um, concept to, lie, to let the lie to let the land life fallow and to just move crops around. Um, and, and farmers do it. They don't do it every seven years. They may do it every three years, but they do it. They do it. And, and in verse two, it says, and, and the shafta, the same word as Shabbat, the land is going to have a Shabbat. The shafta is going to rest. What? For God. It's connected to God. Right. There isn't a statement here that says, do it for the sake of the land. What I was trying ineptly to say is that every religious tradition sees a connection between land, produce, and the God they worship. We put it into a seven-year cycle. Seven is part of our tradition. And we make it not just the material, not just to make the crops better, but as an indication that we know we are dependent upon a spiritual force greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, you even pick that up with the business of don't, don't chop down the trees around a city that's besieged. The point is, you got to be careful. This isn't yours. This is part of God's creation. Thank you for that. Uh, I see Steve. Okay. I was going to say, I mean, I was always taught, at least by Orthodox, that along with you, the Kashrut rules really are not based on health. And while Maybe they picked some of those for that reason. Um, it would be, you don't put the intention there. And I think that the important thing about that, especially today, is going back to the concept of separation we talk about all the time. All the time. We can, we can cook pork in a way that's safe to eat. We have dishes where we don't have to worry if milk and meat have been cooked in them, that it'll cause a problem because of the nature of the material that we're cooking in. So a lot of these things, if you were to focus on the health reasons, then there's probably no reason, if that's all it is, there's no reason for anyone to keep kosher today. Thank you. I mean, yes, you're there. It just reminds me that in the last several months, there have been all kinds of articles in traditional Jewish publications 
noting that the pig has been found to be a vector, I can't think of the right word, zoo something or other, a vector uh, <clears throat> for disease that can leap from animals to people. And it becomes, oh, see, God knew it's another reason. And I just don't want to go there, Steve. I just don't want to go there. I think that is, you know, no. Uh, and, and when someone says, oh, you know, trichinosis, uh, you can get, uh, you know, but then if you go to mad cow disease, that takes care of cows. And, 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 you know, on and on and on it goes. It doesn't work. Yes, I agree with you. Any other comments on this? If not, we're going to go forward in the text. But it's really important that we understand. This is not a breakthrough. Jews discover a relationship between how we farm and the quality of the produce. It was known among the farmers. Okay. What is unique, Tamara said it, is how we connect this with a theological bent to acknowledge our relationship to God. That's what's going on here. And if it has peripheral benefits, call it kavod. That's great. That's cool. But that was not, as far as we can understand it, the intention. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so... Verse 2, when you enter the land, the land shall observe a Sabbath of the eternal. There's a message here. That's why this is fun. When you enter the land, you shall observe a, a, a sabbatical year, a Sabbath of the eternal. What also is not said? What about Jewish farmers on Long Island and New Jersey and wherever else there were large communities? large communities of Jewish farmers in the early 1900s, 19. What about that? Jim, are you thrusting your fist at me or are you volunteering? I, okay, I, I can tolerate being threatened. Um, what about New Jersey? What about Long Island? What does this text say? Don't tell me they didn't know about New Jersey and Long Island. Come on, Jewish communities. Um, Mara. It implies that this doesn't apply to them. Yes. It is one of a small set, usually within the agricultural sphere, of mitzvot, which are strictly Hebrew, tuluyot ba'aretz, which are connected to the land. When we're in the land, observe this. When you're living in New Jersey, it says explicitly in the Torah, in New Jersey, this need not. No, it's no obligation. It's no obligation. Okay? Very interesting. That's why when people say, you know, we have 613 mitzvot, right? And uh, of the classical core commandments in the Torah. You know, there's a whole batch of mitzvot, which are agricultural, and for most of us, impossible to apply. It makes it easier to be Jewish. We don't have to do 613. Then cut out all the sacrifices, cut out all the agriculture. One of my teachers, and I did not validate this, said, well, that only leaves about 100 mitzvot that you have to do. Life is simple. Don't be threatened by 613. We're down to 100. Please. Do me a favor. Don't insult your parents. Cool. We're good. Uh, um, Larry, please. But if um, this is one of the things that people were doing anyway, uh, it, could it be seen as making New Jersey and, and Poland or wherever else you are more holy, more like the Holy Land, because you're doing that wherever you are? I like being with this community. I do enjoy it. I think that's a, a wonderful concept. Tamara, does your son at all in his farming make any Jewish associations? Or no, it's environmental, ecological, and communal. Okay, okay, fine. 
No, it, it, it's practical. It's how they're trying to create sustainable agriculture. It's a very big thing on the West Coast. And, and it's called permaculture. And the idea is to work with how nature best re, re, uh, re, nourishes itself. And this is part of it. So it's strictly for understanding, yes, ecology and long-term uh, non-exploitative use of land and, and animals and everything, but, but not theologically, not Jewishly. Honestly. I am aware that there is in Southern California someplace, maybe nearer San Diego, that there is a farm that has been established communally on Jewish principles, specifically, that it's a Jewish effort to gather Jewish agronomes to, to work the land as part of the, an expression of their Jewish identities. I have not heard, and I don't know, and Larry, this is a fascinating question, whether they impose upon themselves Shemitah, the sabbatical year. That, that would, I have, now I have to go find out. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Okay, we had another hand, do we? I see Jeffrey, Jeffrey Gar, thank you for joining us. We have lots of people joining us. That is super. Uh, okay, bye-bye, Donna, bye-bye. Uh, and Steve? Is returning in the Jubilee year, is returning the land to the original owner one of the meets vote that only applies in the Holy Land? and we're off the hook, or does that one apply everywhere? Because it was only the Holy Land, I guess, where God- You were really good and, and, and gave and it they to got to off the hook. And that would kind of like, you know, that, that, that got me. Uh, we don't want to be off the hook, of course. Um, so let, let's not say that. <clears throat> also, I went fishing for the second time yesterday, and I'm pleased to report that all the fish in the Pacific Ocean were off my hook. Um, and that was fairly sad. Um, the Jubilee year, and I have so much to say about Jubilee, ah, but the Jubilee year is in the promised land. That's where it is. And it's based upon the notion that the land was divided up into tribal portions. And every 50 years, the land, every, the 50th year, the year 50, Jubilee, the year is to, the land is to return to its original owners. Like if the original period starts the year 2000, and then the land gets sold or the land goes into bankruptcy or there is marriage and, and inheritance and the land wanders all over the place. Uh, in year 2050, it all returns to the original owner in the year 2000. It is also true that the rabbis doubt whether this was ever applied, whether it ever happened. It is also true, as I mentioned in my Thursday evening posting, that that Jubilee year thing has been used to prove that the Torah text is proto-Marxian. And that is the language used. That is the language used that Torah really sets the stage for a Marxist view that everyone must be maintained in economic equality. Uh, as much as I'm pleased to say some of my best friends are Marxists and Trumpists, I do swing back and forth no, that's not what is going on here. But it's like Kashrut and health. 
there are things that we read into the text because we need it to be in the text. Okay, six years you sow your field, six years you prune your vineyard and gather the yield, but in the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath. Shavat, Shavat, the, the word Sabbath has the strong meaning of rest. That's what it means to have a Sabbath. It means a strong rest. Shemitah means release. You shall not sow your field or fruit your vineyard. Don't reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of the untrained bot. It shall be a year of complete rest. But hear this. It's really important to pick up on this. But you may eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves, hired bound laborers will live with you, and your cattle, the beasts of your land, may eat all of its yield. You understand? You don't starve to death in the seventh year. The seventh year, you don't work the land, but you live off of the land of what the land produces. So your vines produce grapes, great. You can eat the grapes, but you can't have trimmed and cared for and done that kind of stuff, Cindy. And my question goes back to the Jubilee year. Um, so I assume this Jubilee year only started after the Jews came into the promised land and took the land from the people who already owned it and it wouldn't go back to the people the Israelites took the land from. Excuse conquered, me. Conquered, conquered. Excuse me. Receive the land as a fulfillment of God's promise. But in many cases, there were already people on the land who thought they owned it. You're pushing me, Cindy. Yeah, yeah. of course there are people on the land. And no, it doesn't go back to them. There are several symbols of the covenant. Torah is a symbol of the covenant. The land is symbol of the covenant. Our possessing the land is a symbol of the living covenant between ourselves and God, and God keeps it altanai. How do you translate that? Uh, conditional. Conditional. We get the land and we can do the jubilee and all that so long as we live righteously, justly, care for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and so forth. No, it does not include those who temporarily occupied the land until God could deliver it to us. Okay, can we? I mean, that's how the Torah would read it. Okay? No, it does not go back uh, at that point to others. Question, this is rich with meaning, this stuff. There, there is a level of universalism here, too. Uh, you work the land for six years, but you can't use your employees, your slaves, your resident foreigners, aliens who live in the land. It is explicit in the commentaries. The Ger Toshav, the resident alien, cannot be used in your place to work the land. Now, the Torah and rabbinic literature is filled with legal fictions. Passover couldn't exist without legal fictions. Oh, I got rid of all my chomets. I sold the chomets to the rabbi who sold the chomets to a non-Jew. So I don't own this factory that is filled with grain. And then at the end of Passover, I get it back. Legal fiction. There is no legal fiction to make it possible for you to work the land 
through subterfuge. No one should be working the land. Having said that, I am also aware that in certain quarters, they do attempt to sell the land and buy it back that seventh year. But that is clearly not what is going on here. So the resident alien can't. But look who may eat. Look who may eat of your land. Folks, really important, good stuff. Who can eat of it? You, your male and female slaves, your hired and bound, obligated um, uh, workers who live with you, the cattle, the wild animals. What's being said here? To whom does the land really belong? You understand? It's here. To whom does the land really belong? Folks, it belongs to God, and God wants it available to everyone, everything, beast, human. You want to find Jewish ethical roots? Here, even though the context is something that only happens when you occupy the land in Israel. But the principle? God's the possessor of the land. We are custodians in God's name. I'm sure Steve Miller will tell me there's a, a legal term to describe what that means to, to do that. And on the seventh year, anybody can walk by, pluck a grape, an apple, a banana, or whatever, and eat because it belongs to everybody. Any comment? Any comment on this? Okay. I, I, you know, this is good stuff. And then you shall, we're going to stop with this count seven weeks of years, seven weeks, seven weeks of years, 49 years. Then you shall sound the trump, the horn. The Havarta, what's the Hebrew? Shofar. You sound the shofar. Teruah, a blast. You know Teruah from Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, right? Teruah, right? So there it is. Sound the shofar, make a Teruah. When? Oh. Oh. On the 10th day of the month of Tishrei. When does it go? Yom Kippur. That's when it starts. And then hallow the land. Isn't it incredible? And this will, though I can't go into it today, but next year we will. The big battle is fought by the rabbis in this section as to when the beginning of the year really is. The rabbis will argue based upon the section between Passover and Rosh Hashanah, and when does the year begin? And here, here it says on the 10th day of what? Okay, what does it say here? Uh, sound the horn the seventh month on the 10th tenth, the tenth day of the month that you could argue that Passover is the beginning of the year and here is the seventh month. Very big argument. We're not going to solve it today. I wish everybody great success financially, structurally, in your lives. I wish everyone lives a life of comfort and of plenty. Our text is only asking, folks, would you please remember that you're occupying this plenty in a universe that is of God. Okay? We certainly are not against making a living, doing well, buying Bitcoin and going broke or whatever uh, that you may choose to do. Um, but please remember, 
God is the master. God is the owner of the universe. It all belongs. However we understand God, it just means that there is a spiritual force in the universe and we are not Elon Musk who believes that he controls the universe. We are not. We are servants of a universal ethical vision. That's a good way to end. Sir, I like that. I may use it. Servants of a universal ethic. I like that. I may use it again. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Lots of love. We're going to do Kaddish now. Lots of love. Thank you so very much. Good day. I have so much else here. Hmm. Okay. What about leap year? I'll talk about that next year. Okay. We are now going to mention the names of those who have passed away during the past month. David Burstein, Edward Cohn, Joseph Dannon, Ronald Fishman, Ashley Jaffe, Linda Leisner, Frank Rosenblum, Ralph Silberman, Yusuf Nasser Soleimani, Bert Zwei. And those, the anniversaries of whose deaths have occurred during the past week, Marion Burke Allen, Lena Barkin, Irving Barron, Edmund Bastheim, Chaim Benishai, Lillian Berman, Jenny Berman, Janice Brooks, Sandra Brown, Ann Brown, Vanessa Brown, Marion Corday, Rachmat Dagan, Samuel Dickman, Marie Dolgener, Betsy Dreisen, Helen Epstein, Gerald Bruce Fetterman, Felix Fells, Charlotte Fenning, Oscar Fern, Millicent Friedman, Marlene Gelt, Bernard Benjamin Ginsburg, Marguerite Glicksman, Billy Goldberg, Elaine Goldsmith, Evelyn Gordon, Phil Gore, Samuel Gorin, Charlotte Clayman Green, Alberto Grinberg, Richard Gross, Ella Hausman, Francis Hendon, Betty Hyman, Barbara Onichter, Ralba Immerman, Sam Yitzchaki, Paul Jaspin, Ruth Katz, Laura Keith, Gary Kelston, Beatrice Commissar, Gisela Lipsky, David Lubitz, Winifred Melman, Lenore Meltzer, Diana Menzer, Manavar Danish, Magadam, Edna Mosk, Larry Nix, Richard Pollock, Madeline Mallon Price, Bluma Rekovitsky, Philip Rand, A. Brisman, Harris Robinson, Harry Samuel Rolston, Sam Rosen, Frieda Rosenberg, Rose Rosenbluth, Alan Rowe, Frieda Sade, Mel Saltzman, Eva Shank, Bertha Shapiro, Jerry Sinclair, Harry Steinberg, Selma Stone, Samuel Tuch, David Falk, Sarah Falk, David Walder, Ernest Warsaw, Mildred Weger, Sarah Wharton, Harvey Yatman, Gablin Farhan Zawida, Anita Zellman, Michael Zuckerman. I apologize for names that I have mispronounced. If you have other names you would like remembered at this time, please, please speak those names aloud or speak them in your hearts. We mention as well those who died in defense of the United States, those who have died in defense of the state of Israel, and those who have died through acts of senseless terror and brutal warfare, and those who have no one to remember their names. We say together, Yitkadal, the <laughs> Be it Tabak, be it Paar, be it Roman, be it Nase, 
via tadal, via tale, via talau, shemena kudusha, nuchu, leela min kol birachata v'shirata, tush v'chata v'nechamata, damiran v'alma v'imru amen. Yehi shlama rabba min shemaya v'chayim, alenu v'al kol yisrael, v'imru amen. Ose shalom v'amad. Who Yaaseh Shalom? May God who makes peace in the high places make peace in our hearts, make peace in our homes, make peace in the household of Israel, make peace among all the families and nations of earth, and let us say, Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Have a so, great week. A we great will. Week. See you Wednesday. Bye-bye. For Bye. sure. Bye-bye.